Wales is a land with a rich history that dates back more than 200,000 years. It's been home to European Celtic tribes and Roman and Saxon invaders. Wales is often believed to be a province of the United Kingdom. In fact, it's part of a political unit of four nations that form the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Wales has its own language, traditions, heritage and culture, and its own national football team. For the first time in 64 years, they've qualified for the World Cup, drawing 1-1 against the United States in their opening match. Thousands of Welsh fans have travelled to Qatar to cheer on their team in their most awaited return to the global tournament. One of those who made the journey is the First Minister of Wales. We caught up with him in Doha. Mark Drakeford talks to Al Jazeera. First Minister, Kroiso i Doha, Kroiso i Al Jazeera. Welcome to Doha, welcome to Al Jazeera. So this is the first time that Wales have qualified for the World Cup in 64 years. What took you so long? <laughs> well, it wasn't the lack of trying, I can tell you that. We've come very close to qualifying a number of times over those years, but to be on the stage with only 32 countries from around the world in football is a hugely competitive business. Wales is the smallest country to qualify for this World Cup other than Qatar, who are here as the host. So it's a huge achievement. Of course, rugby in Wales is a, is a, is a much bigger game than football. You talk to people uh, outside of, of, of the UK and everybody seems to know who Gareth Bale is. Yes. OK, so you could argue that Gareth Bale perhaps has done more for Welsh football than, than, than the government has. I mean, uh, does your government invest in grassroots football? Is, is it bringing new players through? Is Wales going to be a, a permanent fixture at World Cups in the future, do you think? Well, certainly we work hard with the Football Association of Wales, the FAW, to invest in grassroots football. But you're right, a small number of global superstars does more to draw attention to the game and to enthuse young people for the game than probably a lot of grassroots day-in, day-out endeavour does. But in the end, it is that at-the-grassroots investment that buys you the future that is a successful one. I'm a, I'm a proud Welshman, and, and, I, and I don't want to talk down my own country, but, but as a, a Welshman, and people ask you here when you're an expatriate, where are you from? You say, Wales. They say, oh, England. No, 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 Wales. Now, Wales does seem to have something of an image problem. Scotland doesn't seem to have this problem. What, why is it so with Wales, do you think? Well, I think it's a very long history of, as you know, the saying is, England and Wales. Uh, with a very big neighbour immediately next door to you, a dominant language, all of those things, Wales has lived under the shadow of all of that. And small countries have to shout louder to be heard. And it's really only in the last 25 years that with a parliament of our own in Cardiff and a sense of separation so that it's not enough these days just to say England and Wales. You've got to attend to Wales specifically. That's 25 years against 500 and more years uh, where the opposite was true. All right, so you're, you're the first minister uh, of Wales. You, you lead a devolved government, as, as you alluded to there. Many people, of course, watching this in the UK will know all about this. People around the world, though, won't understand what this means. What does devolved government mean? What are your responsibilities as the head of a devolved government? So it means that people in Wales vote for their own parliament, which then makes decisions on those things that only apply to people in Wales. And in a way, it's all the things that matter to people day in and day out. So the Welsh Parliament is now responsible for health, for education, for local government, for transport, for agriculture, for the Welsh language, for sport, a long list of things which are the domestic agenda. The UK government remains responsible for things like defence, for foreign affairs, for macroeconomic policy. But the things that you notice in your daily lives now, those decisions are made in Wales by people who people in Wales 
have voted for to make those decisions. But, but you don't set tax rates, is, is, is that true? You're reliant upon the UK government for the income that you have to spend on, on all of those things. Yeah, about 80% of our total income comes via the UK government. About 20% of it comes through taxation decisions made in Wales. At the start of devolution, a quarter of a century ago, 100% of our income came through the UK government. And over time, that has begun to shift, and that's probably a process that we will see continue. It's, as First Minister, though, is that something that, that, that frustrates you? To what extent do you have one hand tied behind your back? Uh, no, I'm not wholly frustrated by it. Uh, while I lead a devolved government, I'm a believer in the United Kingdom. I think the United Kingdom is better off for having Wales in it, and Wales is better off for being in the United Kingdom. And that does mean that some of those big macroeconomic decisions are better made at a UK level. Now, the formula that sends money to Wales needs reform. It has since the very beginning. But the big picture in which those are shared responsibilities, some money raised through UK decisions, some money raised through Welsh decisions, that's the right one for me. You're the leader of the Labour Party in Wales, as well as, as First Minister. The Labour Party, of course, is, the, is Her Majesty's opposition nationally uh, throughout the, the, the UK and the, the government in Westminster is a conservative led government. Uh, is there any friction there between the fact that, that, that Wales is led by the Labour Party and, and the rest of the country is being governed by the Conservatives? Well it does lead to tensions. The, the degree of tension tends to depend on the nature of the government at Westminster. Uh, we've lived through 12 years now of Conservative government. At some points that's been a relatively benign relationship at other times it's been more conflictual a great deal depends upon the degree to which a westminster government respects the devolution settlement not just in relation to wales but scotland and northern ireland as well the reason i'm asking all of this is because recently there was a controversy where, where you lost your, your temper in 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 the senate of the welsh the welsh assembly and we even heard about that in in, in this part of the world uh, and that was a row over, over the health service, which, like the health service right across the UK in Wales, is experiencing uh, uh, problems. It's, it's to, do with, with, to do with funding. And this is why I ask you about the frustration, in that the opposition were blaming you for the health service problems in Wales, but, and you were saying, well, I can only do what I can do given the funding that I'm, that I'm given. Yes. Well, well that uh, discussion took place just after the United Kingdom had gone through those very difficult and damaging weeks of the Liz Truss Premiership. Six weeks that damaged the reputation of the United Kingdom around the world, six weeks that damaged our economy and where people in Wales will be paying to pick up the pieces. My anger was that the Conservative opposition in Wales had no ownership at all of that, not a single word of recognition of what they had done, seeking instead to blame somebody else for the predicament we find ourselves in. And the reason it, it made headlines is because, I mean, it's, it's very unusual for you. You're a, a, a very mild-mannered politician. You're, you're not like the, the kind of politicians that we become used to seeing in, in, in Westminster, in, 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 in London. How did you get into, into politics? I mean, you, you spent a great deal of your career in, in, in academia. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Well, look, uh, I'm a politician by accident. That's what yeah. I normally say. Right. Uh, I came to work in the office of my predecessor, the first minister for the first 10 years of devolution, the founding father of devolution. I worked in his office. I helped to run things in the background. And then he retired and stood down. And I had to decide at that point, did I want to stand for election in that constituency where I lived and to follow from him? And it was a very difficult decision for me, an ambivalent decision. And in the end, what I didn't want to do was to look back in another five years time and ask yourself, oh, well, what if, what if, what if I tried? What if I'd had a go? Uh, so I decided, well, I would have a go and we would see how things worked out. Uh, and as it happened, I got elected and then became a minister. And then the moment came when uh, I just felt the experience I'd had, those 10 years I'd worked in the first minister's office, that that was experience that could be put to work to help Welsh people and the Welsh Parliament through those very testing days of Brexit, then followed by Covid, now followed by another economic crisis. 
So it's putting that experience to work for I people want to, in Wales. I, I want to ask you about, about Brexit in a moment, but, but first, why, why the Labour Party? Um, you're from a part of... We're both South Walians, yeah. but I'm South East Wales, yeah. which was the industrial heartland sure. uh, of Wales. Uh, Labour is the traditional party uh, of that part of the world. You're, you're much further west. I, I could have imagined you being a nationalist, part of the, the, the Plaid Cymru. Well, I had to make a decision very early on in life by the time I was 14, I knew that I had to decide for myself, was I a nationalist or was I a socialist? And I, I knew then that I was a socialist. Being Welsh really matters to me. Our history, our language, our culture, I'm profoundly Welsh in that sense. But politically, I continue to believe that the interests of working people in Wales are not dissimilar to the interests of working people in Scotland or in England either, and that we are better off forging alliances between people whose interests are similar and making progress together, rather than thinking that in the end, the accident of geography, because that's where you're born is, isn't it? Yes. It's an accident. You could be born anywhere. We are lucky enough and happen to be born in Wales. I don't think that's enough to define us. Where do you stand on the issue of independence? We're all we're, uh, internationally, we're we're aware of the, of, of the Scottish government, uh, that the, which is run by the, the Nationalist Party. Their desire to have another referendum on, on independence. What what about Wales? Well, my view is is that we have the best of both worlds. We are members of the United Kingdom, with the advantages that that brings to us in Wales, and those advantages are real. But we also have the huge advantages of being a devolved nation where we make so many decisions for ourselves. But you're not fully in control. No, and I wouldn't want to be fully in control. My own view of the world is, is that the more we atomize things, the more we separate ourselves off from other people, the harder the world becomes. I don't want to leave the union that is the United Kingdom. I didn't want to leave the union that is the European Union either, because I think that sharing things with others who have close interests with you while retaining that powerful set of decisions that lie in your own hands, that's a combination that works for Wales. How much damage has, has Brexit done to the, to the Welsh economy? The, the people of Scotland voted, uh, in, a majority of people there voted to remain within the EU. In Wales, that wasn't the case. More people wanted to leave than, than, than stay in the UK. And yet, and yet Wales was receiving a lot of money from, from the EU. That, that's got to have hurt. Well, leaving the European Union is an act of economic self-harm. But it's largely because of the way we've left the European Union. Once people in Wales had voted to leave, my focus was never on the fact of Brexit, because that had been decided, but the form of Brexit. We ended up with the hardest form of Brexit, with the severing of economic relationships, with damage done to the relationships between the United Kingdom and our closest and most important neighbours. There was a different way of leaving the European Union where we would have removed ourselves from the political mechanisms, but stayed in the single market, stayed in the customs union, protected the interests of working people and firms in Wales. We chose not to do it that way, or the UK government chose not to do it that way. And the harm it causes, the economy in Wales, is real and continues every day. So you, you're, you lead the largest party in the Welsh Assembly, but, but only just. Yep. Uh, the, the, the nationalists aren't uh. far behind. If, if the nationalists uh, take power in, in the Welsh Assembly and campaign for an independent Wales, could Wales survive, do you think, as, as an independent nation, especially without the EU money that, that it was getting before Brexit? Well, just to make one point, we have a 60-seat parliament. We have 30 seats. In fact, the Conservative Party that is the next largest, right, right. it has 16, and the Nationalist Party has fewer than half the number of seats that the Labour Party has. So it's a long distance uh, from being in power. If, however, any party were to win an election on a manifesto that says they would put the issue of independence to the Welsh people and won, then, of course, Wales could be independent. I've never believed the argument that says it's simply not possible. The price would be high. The price would be high in terms of people's standard of living, in terms of the new responsibilities that you would have to discharge. But the argument for me is not whether 
independence is possible. It's just that we've got a better deal on the table. In, in what shape is the Welsh economy right now? When, when you and I were, were growing up, of course, it was an industrial powerhouse. Yep. We, had, we had coal mines, we had steel works. All of that now has gone. How, do, how does Wales make a living these days? Well, Wales has recovered from COVID very strongly. Our unemployment level is lower than the UK as a whole. And when I was growing up, the number of people who were out of the workplace because of sickness economically inactive was the highest in the UK and rising and over the 20 years of devolution it's come down and down. So we are not in bad shape despite the headwinds we face and what we're doing is creating a new economy for Wales and renewable energy means that after a period in which our geography was against us, far out on the western edge of Europe, long supply chains, expensive ways of uh, moving goods and jobs, now our geography is on our side. We have wind because we face the Atlantic. We have rain, as you know, every now and then. But we have solar and we have wave power as well. 56% of all the electricity we use in Wales this year will be generated from renewable sources. That'll be 70% by the end of this decade. And in those new industries, those industries that will secure energy that is safe, that is secure, that deals with climate change, there's the future of Wales. But you still, uh, in, in, in Wales, you, you, you have problems with, with infrastructure in that the, 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 it's difficult to get from the north of the country to, to the south of the country without going Sorry. into Wales and taking, uh, yeah. into England rather, and taking a rather yeah. circuitous route. Well, that in the end is just the nature of our geography. We're a mountainous country, we're a small country. I sometimes uh, read it said that if you flattened Wales out, we'd be as big as France. Fantastic. Uh, it's just that all our land is you know, hilly, one up and down, and easy routes north and south have never been possible in Wales. So you know, we, we manage, we have an effective train service, you can drive, it's not the s most straightforward of routes, but you know, we're used to it. It's what we've dealt with for 2,000 years. And it is a land of uh, amazing culture as well as, 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 well as uh, scenery. One of your jobs as, as First Minister, of course, is to promote Wales and attract trade and investment, but it, it's to promote Wales culturally uh, as well. What, 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 are you, what are you particularly proud of about Oh, the, the I'm country? hugely proud, of course, of our language. The oldest spoken language in Europe, the longest continuous written language in Europe. And, uh, can I tell you something? Sorry to interrupt. No, no, I, I'll tell you something that shames me to this day. I grew up in a period where, where the Welsh language, and you could argue, was being suppressed, particularly in, in the part of South Wales in which I grew up. I'm a Welshman. I don't speak Welsh. I, I'm, not, I'm not fluent in Welsh like you. I'm bits and bobs. I can yeah, read it. Yeah. And, and that, that I'm ashamed to, 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 to say that. But now at least every kid in, in Wales, am I right in saying, yes. grows up every child learning, learns learning the language. The language. Yeah. And a third, over a third of young people in our secondary schools receive their whole of their education through the medium of Welsh. And the growth in Welsh medium education has been a real story of Wales in the last 30 years. But that is a real sea change. You know, even when I was in school, the thought was, was that Welsh was the language of the home and the hearth and it wasn't the language of the official world. You didn't deal with the world through the medium of Welsh, that was English. And if, to get on, English was the language you would need. Well, that has definitely changed. By 2050, we have an ambition, which I think we will reach, of having a million Welsh speakers in Wales. And in a global economy, if you're trying to attract investment, you have to have something special to offer. Why go there rather than some other spot on the globe? And people who come to Wales, investors who come to Wales, they need to feel they are somewhere special that has an identity and a difference and you can feel that you're somewhere that is special and different. And that's why our language and our culture matters economically as well as in every other way. All of these people learn, learning the Welsh language, as you say, and, and, and the culture, having your own language, might push toward people towards nationalism. It, 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 would that be a, a fair assessment? In that, and although we talked about, about Plaid, the, the, the nationalists in, in, in Wales at the moment being in a, in a minority, that, that, that their support could grow politically. Well, of course, that is possible. But the Labour Party first won an election in Wales in 1922, and we've never not done it since. 
uh, these 100 unbroken years of a relationship between my party and the Welsh people. Uh, and my job is to try and make sure that that's the key relationship, that to be Welsh and to be Labour are two, rela two identities that sit right upon one another, hand in glove. And we do that by working hard at it all the time. Whenever I'm preaching to my uh, troops, I'm always saying, we never take a single vote for granted. Every time we are out there talking to people, it is another opportunity to re-cement the relationship that we have built up between people in Wales, the things that matter to them, and their feeling that the Labour Party has been the best vehicle to achieve those and things. And that level of support for the Labour Party hasn't changed, despite the fact that, that, that Wales as, as a country has, has changed. It's not, as we said earlier, the industrial powerhouse that it, that it once was. No, well, in the last uh, election for the Welsh Parliament, which was in May of last year, we achieved the largest share of the vote that we have at any time in the devolution period. So, you know, that relationship remains really strong. And the language belongs to everybody. It belongs to everybody, whether you speak it fluently or you just know a few words of it. And I think one of the wonderful things about the language is the people who don't speak it are as proud of it and as committed to it being part of Welsh life as people who were brought up speaking it every day. There are rumours that, that perhaps you're, you're, you're talking about slowing down, perhaps. How long do you think you'll, you'll, you'll stay at this? Uh, I said in the very beginning, when I was first standing for the leadership of my party, that I thought five years was the sort of period that somebody doing this job in the modern era should think about doing it. I'm not quite there yet but I'm well over halfway there and you know I would never walk away from the job at a time when the going was tough or there were difficult decisions that needed to be made but the time will come during the Senedd term I've been part of the Senedd for the first quarter of a century it's time we elected somebody who looks ahead to the next 25 years. You, you talked about the pandemic in Wales you, you've been you've been praised for, for the way in which you handled uh, the pandemic in, in, in Wales, as opposed to how the national government in London handled the, the pandemic. I mean, w when you look back, when the time eventually comes, mm. when you look back over, over, over your career, well, what, what would you want your legacy to be, do you think? Well, I don't think much in terms uh, of legacy, to be honest. Uh, uh, I think I'd be happy with an epitaph that said, he came into work every day and he tried to do his best. <laughs> right. OK. Is there anything that you, that you still want to do? Uh, I, 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 oh. I'm not, I mean, in politics, yes. I mean, tell, but, but is there anything else, in any ambition you have uh, in, in, in life still? Oh, many things that I will be very keen to do when I don't have to spend as much time doing what I do now. As you said, I spent most of my working life uh, in the university, and uh, I hugely miss teaching. Right. Uh, I miss being with young people, I miss the excitement you get with watching young people learn and sometimes being able to uh, pass on some things to them that they may find useful. So uh, I'd very much like to be able to go back and do a little bit of that. My poor neglected allotment will look forward to seeing a bit more of me than it normally does and uh, there are even family members who might like to spend a bit more time in my company. The world at the moment is, is, is watching uh, Qatar because it's hosting the World Cup. More visitors here, uh, uh, something like a million people are coming to, to, to Qatar, many of them for the first time. Is this your, is this your, your yes, first? Yes, my first. Uh, what, what are your impressions of the place? And I mean, you talk about Wales being a, a small nation, um, a, a nation that wants to keep its, its language and culture alive. I mean, there are very mm. similarities, a lot of similarities between Wales and, and, and Qatar, aren't there? Yes. Apart so from the weather. Well, <laughs> apart from the weather, indeed. No, th look, I think those things are very apparent when you are here. Uh, I spent the first part of the day on economic contacts, but the second half of the day I spent on cultural contacts. I've been in the Museum of Islamic Art because it has a relationship with the National Museum uh, in Cardiff of Wales. We're looking forward to welcoming some young women educators and curators from the museum here to spend time with us in Wales in the summer. So those, some of those similarities are very apparent when you're here. The biggest impression you get is what an astonishing undertaking the World Cup is for any country that takes it on. 
uh, just the sheer investment you have to make to make a tournament like this possible. And if I, if I detect any emotion in the many meetings that I have had with government officials and ministers and so on, it's a slight sense of relief that the football is actually here. There was an opening ceremony, there was a match, and that the football, which has taken all those years in the planning, is now actually where the centre of attention will be. Mark Drakeford, First Minister, Diokonovel, thank you for being with us on Al Jazeera. Thank you very much indeed.